Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a, it's a beautiful day. I'm glad that you all made it out. Um, uh, my name is Rebecca, and I am in charge of our programming here at The Grace. And we are so excited about our speaker tonight. We were introduced to uh, Jason Dean by um, our previous photography um, <laughs> ex- exhibit, the artist that we had on view. He, he came to an opening, and Allison and I got to talking about Carl Herzog and different authors and uh, different artists and collaborations and things, because that had interested me for a long time. And she said, oh, well, you should meet my friend. <laughs> <laughs> And so, um, so we started talking, and uh, thankfully, Humanities Texas finds it very interesting as well. And so we're very lucky that Humanities Texas has funded his visit, and so he's able to come see us tonight, and we're going to record this talk. So if someone wanted to watch it later, they'd be able to watch it um, on our website and on our social media. Um, and then tomorrow, he's going to go back to Harden simmons and speak to them. And then on Saturday, I would encourage anyone to go to Albany, and he'll be presenting a different talk um, about similar subject matter at the Old Jail Arts Center. Um, so please check that out. It's, it's going to be a nice day Saturday, too. So maybe a little cooler, but nice. Um, so please make the drive out there and support them as well. Um, I'm going to let Jason speak about himself, but I will say that Jason is the <laughs> director of Special Collections and Archives at Southwestern University. And so he has brought some things from his collection, and we're very grateful for that because that's a rare opportunity. So I'm going to let him tell you a little bit more about himself, and then we'll get started. Thank you all. So hi, all. Uh, my name's Jason. Uh, I should say a little something about myself. I graduated Hardin Simmons in 2005. Uh, that I'm third generation, one of my professors is here, our former dean of libraries is here. I feel well supported in the community of former and recovering cowboys. Um, I wanna say thanks to everybody that's here this evening. Um, I think that um, Herzog now is a little underappreciated. I think we're kind of past an age of the, well, the golden age of Texana. Uh, You can ask me about that after the presentation. but I'm glad that you're here to hear about his work, and uh, I, I will be glad to share some of it with you um, after the presentation. Uh, I want to thank Rebecca especially. She's been super nice to me uh, and has arranged this. Um, I want to add my voice to thanking Humanities Texas for making this visit possible. Um, I want to make sure to thank, even though none of them are here, maybe they're here on Facebook. Hi, Facebook. Um, I want to thank my colleagues at Special Collections at Southwestern University. Uh, them and my wife, Jennifer Dean, listen to more run-throughs of this presentation than should be allowed for uh, a sane human being. Um, so tonight, I'm going to spend about 40 minutes um, talking about Carl Herzog um, and how he defined what we think of visually as a Texas or a Western book. Uh, I, to my mind, there are eight reasons for this. Um, I put little cues up here, um, but the eight reasons are these, a little further expounded. He chose to work with very strongly connected to Texas authors uh, and Western authors as well. He was fortuitous in his choice for where he worked, which was El Paso, Texas, uh, still barely in Texas, but very much in the Western United States. His very close attention to all aspects of book design of any book that bore his printer's mark. Um, So that includes the selection of typefaces, the selection of paper, creation of specific bindings, um, illustrations, and then the page layout itself. Uh, He was fortunate in that during the bulk of his career there was no printer working in Texas, certainly before Bill Whitliff the arrival of Bill Whitliffe on the, on the scene that uh, worked at the same caliber or level as Carl Hartzog. Um, and he was in the right place at the right time. Um, about 10 years into Herzog's career, so let's say the 1930s, Texans were beginning to find themselves more wealthy than they had been in the past, uh, largely as a result of petroleum um, lifting many boats, I guess is the cliche. Um, That led to this newly wealthy class of Texans, led to added national interest from the country to Texans. So Texans had money to produce really nice books, 
And people outside of Texas were interested in these strange creatures from Texas and what they did with the ungodly amounts of money that they had. He was also fortunate to work uh, about 60 years in his career, so that length of career allowed him to uh, become kind of a senior statesman of printing and uh, really put his strong th thumbprint uh, and his mark on printing. And finally, uh, he was very discerning in what he chose to and not to produce. Um, he didn't really associate his name with things that he didn't think would fit his own concept of what Texas and Western printing would be. Um, he did do a, a number of things for the University of Texas at El Paso, uh, but that was, a, uh, as director of the Texas Western Press, the things that he chose uh, to print, I think, reflect his interest in the American West and in Texas. Fortunately for you, I'm not going to talk about all eight of these. I'm only going to talk about three. The authors that Herzog chose to work with, we'll look at four authors this evening. The careful attention that Herzog brought to his work I think is going to be self-evident, but I will shine a light on some of those aspects. And then implied, especially in the last book that we'll talk about tonight, is that Herzog was at, in the uh, right time at the right place. So there he is, Herzog, on the right at the press at the University of Texas at El Paso with Haywood Antone. Uh, Haywood Antone was his successor as the director of the Texas Western Press, which was then, um, it was the precursor uh, for the University of Texas at El Paso. He was born in 1902 as Jean Carl Herzog, uh, and he was born in 1902 in Lyons, France. Um, shortly, uh, well, his parents were on honeymoon, and it wasn't too long after they were married, so I will let your imagination run wild as to what happened between his parents uh, and why he was born in France. Carl was given his first printing press at the age of 10. Um, I'm not going to recount these kind of mythical stories about how he was instantly taken to it. I will say that by the time he was 18 years old, he was a journeyman printer, so he's very much in this kind of apprentice model of learning how to print, design, and bind books. Uh, he lived most of his career um, before 1923 in Pittsburgh, studied at the Carnegie Institute of Technology where he furthered his studies in typography and book design, uh, and then uh, was hired by the McMath Company of El Paso in 1923, and it was his career from 1983 till his death in 1984, during which he took on the name Printer at the Pass, which is the name of the famous Carl Herzog bibliography, which I have issues with. But that's another thing you can talk to me about after the presentation. During his approximate 60-year career, he was responsible for over 300 major book projects and countless pieces of ephemera. That printer at the past bibliography, um, Al Lohman, who wrote it, who was probably the, uh, the greatest scholar of the career of Carl Herzog, um, said, I just kind of picked some. An ephemera, by the way, according to Al Lohman, is anything less than eight pages. Uh, anything more than eight pages constitutes a book. This is a portrait of Herzog uh, by the fairly well-known El Paso artist and illustrator Jose Cisneros. Um, in this image, Cisneros is really asserting Herzog's um, fathering uh, of fine press printing in Texas. And I think he does it a little loudly, um, and here's why. The first thing I want to point out is this here, which is mesquite, uh, which uh, is all over Texas, as you all know, uh, and was also uh, featured in the end papers for this book, The King Ranch. Um, so he's talking about some of Herzog's most well-known work, The King Ranch, with Tom Lee. Here is Mount Franklin outside of uh, the city of El Paso, uh, appropriately a cactus and uh, a spur, what looks like a spur to me. I think the most interesting part of this image are the printer's marks that are behind Herzog. So when a, uh, a printer designs their own mark to put in books that they've made, it's called a printer's mark, uh, as we call it in the trade. This is the one that Carl Herzog most frequently used, the CH. Next to it is an older one. Um, this older one he used when he wanted to remind people of his family's history in 16th century Germany as printers. Uh, this is a familial mark that he adapted to his own um, monogram. Next to that, uh, continuing kind of a German idea, is the printer's mark of Peter Fust and Johann Schuffer. 
uh, who most people have never heard of, and that's because we all know the first book printed in the West was the Bible, but we don't call it the Bible, we call it the Gutenberg Bible. Uh, Johannes Gutenberg was largely responsible for it, uh, the funding and the organization of the project, but Fust and Schiffer were responsible for the hands-on work of the production of that first book printed in the West. Underneath that is the printer's mark of Winken de Word, who was the second printer in England after John Caxton. Uh, Winken de Word popularized printing uh, and set several English printing standards that we still have in books today. And underneath that, I hope you can see it, is the printer's mark and most popular tattoo for librarians, the printer's mark of Aldous Minucius, which is, if you can't see it, a anchor uh, and a, a dolphin wrapped around it and the words Aldous going from side to side. Aldous Minucius invented um, many, he was an Italian printer, and he invented many of the conventions that we see in works today. Title pages, page numeration, italic type, uh, and scholarly editions. He was the first person to print non-Greek alphabet uh, in the West, I mean non-Greek, non-Western alphabet in the world. I'm thinking about Greek. He was the first one to print Greek from hand-cut type, uh, wooden type, by the way. Herzog uh, was tireless in his efforts to raise the standards of printing uh, over his 61-year career. And I say that uh, with... Uh, the understanding that I'm going to share with you now, which is that most type set today is done on a computer and it's printed digitally. Um, it requires attention to detail and it requires effort, but not the same level of effort that is required for someone working at the time that Herzog spent most of his career. Herzog would have set type uh, in one of two ways, well, using two machines. He would have created type first by monotype, Mono, single, uh, monotype machine casts a single character of type at a time. So you could print 45 A's, or you could program a tape, and it could print out a whole line of individual characters of type. And then you'd put that on a press, and you'd print it. That's monotype. The most frequently used kind of typesetting that Herzog would have used, and most printers would have used for much of the 20th century, until the strong advent of digital typography was the linotype machine. And the linotype machine uh, is one of the most complex mechanical uh, devices ever created. It is, um, it's insane. There's a, there's a movie called Linotype, the film, if you geek, up, geek out about linotype like I do, um, which I would commend to you. But the linotype machine is basically a, a machine with a gigantic keyboard. On the left-hand side uh, are capital letters, and on the right-hand side are lowercase letters. So the printer, Herzog sometimes, but also Pressman working in his shop, would have a copy of TypeScript on the machine, and they would look at it, and they would type out each individual line. The machine arranges these things called matrices, drops it uh, down, makes a lead mold from molten lead, which is sitting right next to you, which is great when it squirts all over the printer, uh, and then gums up the works, uh, and then that lead type is cooled and spit out the bottom. So it's a little more efficient way to set type than it is to do by monotype. So either of these processes required Herzog's hands-on and direct involvement in any project that bore his name. Some more of his attention, some less of his intention, attention, but they all demanded his, uh, his integration and his attention to a project. Um, he ran kind of two print shops. There was one that he operated um, privately, and then he operated the press shop at the University of Texas at El Paso. Those are used interchangeably, depending upon the demands of a specific job. He was also a lecturer at the University of Texas at El Paso. He was a widely sought public speaker on printing and book arts and book history. Um, and finally, of most interest to our talk this evening, he worked with noted Texas authors of his time, including Tom Lee, J. Evitz Haley, John Graves, and J. Frank Doby. This is a, I wouldn't quite call it a book. This is it. Um, it's a project that he worked on with J. Frank Doby. He never did a full-length book with Doby. Uh, though they were friends uh, for quite some time. This is a Christmas greeting that J. Frank and Bertha Doby sent out um, to their friends, uh, I think for 1964. You all can tell me because it's on the bibliography. 
Um, but it was a Christmas greeting. So first of all, I really wish I could send something this fancy to my friends, but I can't. Um, it is printed, the cover you see, uh, with a, an adobe brick. This is, I know, I can say, was used at least twice in Herzog's career. He used an adobe brick for the printing of the cover, in this case, uh, because the tale that's told inside is about the Mezcla Man, um, which he's made of adobe. Um, the titles are uh, set in Bauer Legenda. I should note, though, that Doby was a J, uh, J. Frank Doby was a 1910 graduate of Southwestern University, so we have a large body of his work there. This is the third of seven projects Herzog did for Doby. They met through their mutual friend Tom Lee in the 1930s. Um, the titles are set in a, in a typeface that Herzog used frequently, Bauer Legenda. You'll see a lot of these typefaces uh, over and over again this evening because Herzog was using them frequently at the time that he printed all of these works. Um, the body is set in Bauer Legenda. No, that's not right. Linotype Caldonia. He would have set it with a linotype machine. Linotype Caldonia here. Uh, that's the page shred. It was 1954. I was wrong. Herzog printed these in an edition of 1,000, um, so I guess he had an awful lot of friends, as did Bertha. Uh, it's an expansion of his essay, uh, first in On the Open Range, which was printed in 1931. Dobie had met with some fame by that point in his career and was asked to write a book designed for children of reading age, but maybe over the age of, not over the age of about 10. Um, and he says that I expanded it uh, and added some notations. Interestingly, it continues a theme for Dobie, which is the utilization and co-opting of Mexican and Spanish folk tales. Um, without identification of where they came from. This is a, one of the ways in which Herzog popularized folk narrative in Texas. Um, the frontispiece, uh, you might recognize it, is by Jose Cisneros, who did the portrait we saw earlier of Doby. And the scarecrow on it in English says, dig out to the east and the west the way my hands are pointing and you will find the gold. It's a, he loved treasure stories, so it's a treasure story. I also want to go back and say that this was, um, the format of this is very strange. Um, it is not really what I would describe as a, a standard dimension for a uh, Herzog printed work, if there is a standard dimension. Um, Herzog wanted this size because he felt like it fit in the hand of the reader very nicely, uh, but it also asked him um, to experiment some with his normous, normal modus of working um, you see the margins are very thin here. Um, and usually you jam in a bunch of text in that, which tends to make a document, a printed document, hard to read. Think about a newspaper. Think about line length in a newspaper. The shorter the line, the easier it is to read. You really don't want to exceed about 90 characters in a line. Herzog avoided hitting that limit by giving really ample spacing between words in this work. Um, it's, it's a bit unusual, and I think that it's, it's an example of Herzog kind of challenging himself in a way and kind of feeling out new directions um, in his work. Second book for this evening is Fort Concho and the Texas Frontier by J. Evitz Haley. Um, J. Evitz Haley first came to notice with the XIT Ranch of Texas. Um, he was a historian. I think it's safe to say that he was an ultra-conservative political activist and absolutely, a West Texas rancher. His library uh, is now uh, in Midland. Haley and Herzog were longtime friends and very frequent collaborators. Actually, they collaborated almost more than anyone else in Herzog's career. They had 18 projects together. This book, Fort Concho and the Texas Frontier, began as a 20-year project funded by the rancher Houston Hart. Hart sought to record the data associated with the history of Tom Green County, which for many years comprised the majority of West Texas. And in 1945, Hart felt like he'd collected enough data, that there was enough there for a narrative, and so commissioned J. Evitz Haley to write this book, and separately commissioned Carl Herzog to design and print the work. Um, though it is uh, uh, under the imprint of the San Angelo Standard Times, San Angelo, Texas, it was printed in El Paso. 
Coincidentally, it was issued in a trade edition, which this is, and a San Angelo edition of 185 copies, um, which I have not laid eyes on, uh, but it's, uh, I think, bound in leather. Uh, yeah. Harold Bugby, uh, you can barely see it. It says H.D. Bugby did the illustrations. Uh, Bugby is another kind of connection in this story of Herzog and Haley. He was an artist and also a curator at the Panhandle Plains Museum in Canyon. Uh, Panhandle Plains was partially funded by J. Evitz Haley, uh, and they had a long-time association. Typically, when Panhandle Plains wanted to publish something extra special, they'd approach Herzog and Haley both. Uh, Al Lohman, who I mentioned earlier, noted that Harold Bugby contributed some of his very finest pen and ink drawings to this endeavor. And I would agree, uh, the line of cavalrymen is especially appropriate for the title of Fort Concho. The maps are by our now good friend, Jose Cisneros, on the left. Uh, the titles, again, are in Bauer Legenda here, and the body is in Linotype Caldonia, remember, set by Linotype. Um, the book, if you'll excuse me, rather than show you a picture of it, I can show you the thing itself. is this color, which is supposed to, according to Herzog, approximate the reddish-brown hue of Concho River mud. I think this is amusing because most rivers in West Texas are kind of close to this color, so I don't think that it makes the Concho River stand out especially strongly, but it's supposed to make you think of it. Uh, the page margins, again, are small. This is printed at about the same time as Mezclaman. Uh, but in this case, in order to relieve the reader's eye, he uses uh, a bit more what's called letting. We would call that, in word, line spacing. You know, you want a double spaced or you want a 1.5 spaced line. Letting is what you use when you set type. You actually put pieces of lead or brass between uh, lines of text, and it gives you more line spacing. Um, I think that the, the overall effect is pleasing and appropriate. Um, and is definitely, I think, kind of a, a continuing perfection of that line, which uh, Dobie had explored some in Mezclaman. The third author that uh, I want to talk about this evening that Herzog worked with was John Graves. Uh, this is absolutely uh, John Graves' most famous book, Goodbye to a River, which I hope many of you all have read. Uh, it is Described, I've heard it described as Texas's Walden. So what Walden did for conservation in New England, John Graves' Goodbye to a River did for conservation in Texas. The story is, uh, a, a, I wouldn't call it a memoir necessarily, but an accounting of John Graves' trip down the Brazos River in 1957. So Graves grew up along the river, hearing stories of the river, canoed it himself, and when he heard that there were going to be 13 dams uh, constructed along the Brazos River, he said, the river's never going to be the same again as I remember when I was a child, and I should take one last canoe trip. So there's quite a bit of nostalgia in the book as well. But he uses his trip down the river at specific points to talk about historic events that had happened along the river, um, and also to begin to highlight the plight of the Brazos River if it was dammed. Coincidentally, it was successful. They only built three of the proposed 13 dams. Um, the cover is uh, illustrated by Russell Waterhouse. That is Graves. We're watching Graves in his canoe there on the Brazos River. Here's the title page spread, which I did both sides because it is especially pleasing. Um, Herzog had this convention that uh, he would print what we call in the trade a half title, which is just the title of the book without, say, the publisher's information um, or maybe even the author. And uh, Herzog called that the bastard title page. Uh, and Dobie frequently referred to it as that because he hated that Herzog made him not sign the title pages of uh, any of the books that Herzog had worked on. Um, he was frustrated by that. Anyway. Uh, this is unusual in that Carl Herzog uh, worked uh, with Alfred A. Knopf of New York City on this book. So he was not directly responsible for uh, the printing of this book. It was done off-site. 
So that required Herzog to work um, in what he considered less than optimal conditions, which was the printer would send him page proofs and they would come to his home in El Paso. He would edit them by hand and send them back to the printer. The printer would edit the type so that they would uh, correct according to Herzog's notes and then the printing press, I mean the printing run was made. Uh, again with the Russell Waterhouse illustrations. This one I love. I think maybe my favorite part of the story is Graves gets on his canoe uh, with his dachshund puppy who is there in the uh, bow of the canoe. I think that's especially sweet. And it also, I think, this, and this is intentional by Herzog, uh, that it gives us a sense in a way of traveling down the Brazos River in the canoe um, with John Graves. First page, oh no, that's not the first page, it's the 301st page of text. Again, set in uh, linotype, this time Electra typeface, um, which was easy for Herzog to work on because he didn't have to reset them by hand because he had the page proofs, but um, is difficult to reset for the printer. This is the cloth cover, so we saw the uh, dust jacket here. This is the cloth cover, which I think is lovely. Similar shade to Fort Concho. Um, here we see a Native American looking over the Brazos River. My guess is that this is supposed to be a Comanche Indian uh, because Herzog, I mean not Herzog, Graves speaks at length about the Comancheria as well as um, Comanche Indians and frequently violent relationships between Anglos and Native Americans on the Brazos River. So the final author we'll talk about this evening is the person that you see on the left of this image, Tom Lee. Uh, Carl Herzog is here on the right. Herzog is holding one of the most important collaborations between Lee and Herzog, the calendar of 12 travelers uh, through the pass of the north. Um, ask me about that if you want to know a fun typographical story about it. And Lee is holding um, the Saddle Blanket edition of the King Ranch, which is our final book we will discuss this evening. Lee and Herzog were friends from 1937 until Herzog's death from emphysema in 1984. Uh, they were responsible for 15 major book projects and a number of ephemera. Frequently, Herzog, uh, Lee would contribute an illustration to a Herzog book just as a favor to his friend. Um, Absolutely the most important book of their career and probably the magnum opus of their collaboration is this book, which we have a copy of here, The King Ranch, which is written by Tom Lee. Tom Lee first came to notice and interest as an artist and an illustrator. He did many murals and then began, I wouldn't say experimenting, but began a career also as a writer. This is printed for The King Ranch. Um, and the Kleberg family, who then and still are managers and involved, and well, Klebergs aren't managers anymore, but at the time the Klebergs were managers of the King Ranch, Klebergs are still strongly associated with the King Ranch, uh, who are direct descendants of uh, the Kings themselves. The Kleberg family, specifically Bob Kleberg, approached Tom Lee in 1951 and said, Tom, I want you to write a history of the King Ranch. I keep talking about Dobie because he runs into so much kind of printed Texas literature and history at this time. Dobie uh, probably would have murdered somebody to get the job of writing this history. The Klebergs despised Dobie. They thought him a failed academian, uh, which is amusing because he certainly didn't try to carry himself off as that, but the Klebergs did not like him, but they liked Tom Lee. And they liked Tom Lee because of the way that he wrote about bullfighting in the book, The Brave Bulls and the illustrations that he did. They felt like he had a strong sense of what it was like to work on a ranch and to work with livestock. So they approached him and Lee agreed. It was initially planned as a modest affair of about 250 or 300 pages. Uh, they, set the, they estimated the production budget at approximately uh, $17,000, um, which is approximately $164,000 today. Herzog was contracted to design and print the book. And it was supposed to be finished in two years, uh, in time for the centennial of the King Ranch in 1953. But Bob Kleberg, in many um, letters, and maybe unintentionally, kept saying, spare no expense about the project and let's get it right. And I think Lee and Herzog took that to the nth degree. 
because the production of this book took six years instead of the originally planned two, so it was three times longer. The production cost, again, not accounting for research, uh, writing, or printing uh, Herzog's own time, the production cost for the binding and printing of the book uh, ended up being $65,000, that was from $17,000, or, if you prefer, $609,000. Uh, I would challenge you to find a family that's willing to spend over half a million dollars printing a book like this today. Remember I said right place, right time. Uh, the final book uh, was 838 pages, up from a, a proposed 250 to 300 pages, in two volumes, not one. There were 43 full-color illustrations, seven maps, 11 document facsimiles, and 63 pages of footnotes. Um, I argue, and I don't think I'm alone in this, that this is the most strong printed manifestation of what the King Ranch feels like, as well as uh, the place that is Texas. I also want to note that Lee not only wrote the text, but also created all of the illustrations for this book. This is the slip cover for uh, the limited edition of the book. Um, it was published in two editions. The trade edition was uh, published by Little Brown and Company, but it was printed in El Paso. And then there was a limited edition of the book, uh, also called the Saddle Blanket Edition. Um, the Saddle Blanket is, is the only one issued in a fancy slip case. The trade edition has a board slip case that tends to fall apart after time. Herzog, uh, this, the story of this label is, there's two stories involved in this label. There is no leather anywhere else on this book, which seems a little strange for a book about a ranch. Um, Herzog said to Lee, since this is a cow outfit, we ought to use some leather. And there's his leather. The tear, you frequently see a tear in any of the copies of this book on the market. The tear is the result of an overzealous person who uh, put too much glue on the shipping boxes for the King Ranch and put the cased saddle blanket editions uh, in the box before they were shipped and so people took them out, ripped the leather label. So you'll see uh, it, more knowledgeable Texana uh, book dealers and collectors will say, as all copies, this has the torn label. They're torn in different places, but they're all torn. This is the cover for the saddle blanket edition, uh, which gives this edition its informal name. Uh, Herzog called it the uh, rag paper edition for reasons we'll approach in just a moment. Um, it mimics the design of the King Ranch saddle blankets. The original idea that Lee and Herzog had after meeting with Bob Kleberg one evening was to bind the special edition of the book in leather from cattle on the King Ranch. And they thought, oh, well, that's a fantastic idea. And so Lee and Herzog are returning to their bedrooms after a late night talking session with Bob Kleberg, and they notice on the floor a saddle blanket, and they said, that's what we have to use. That's what the cover of the book should be. And so, there it is. Uh, it is uh, referred to as crash linen, but the, the appropriate term for this is, or the specific term for this is Bancroft's, the manufacturer, natural finish buckram. I've handled a lot of buckram books in my day, and this is much nicer than a normal buckram book. Um, the blanket design is offset printed in a, a brown tone. I can show you the, the cover um, after the presentation. And it was bound, appropriately enough, in the city of San Antonio by Universal Bookbindery. I hope you can see the outline of the mesquite. Um, it's on a yellow. All of the end papers uh, for the saddle blanket edition are done in yellow. Uh, there's the mesquite with the needles. The trade edition all has green end papers, again giving you a sense of place in the book. This is the first page of text, Lee's illustration. Herzog's typesetting. I, I'd want to take a second and reflect on um, the size of this type. The typeface is Centaur, which was designed by Bruce Rogers, which was a Hertz, uh, Herzog favorite. Um, Herzog once uh, got praise from Bruce Rogers for his book, Peleliu Landing, which he did with Tom Lee. Uh, Bruce Rogers said, this is the, about that book, this is the best use of, of my typeface that I've ever seen, and then asked for a discounted copy because he was broke at that point. Um, the centaur type is uh, in 16 point, which to give you a sense, yes, it's, the, it's approximately the same idea as picking 16 from the drop down text size menu in Word, um, but to give you an idea of what most people did, 
Um, books were typically printed in 11 or uh, 12 point font. Uh, and the line spacing is very ample here. That is three points of letting. Uh, most books had two or one. The point of this is to give you a sense of spaciousness. Uh, the King Ranch being the largest ranch at that time in Texas, um, they're trying to imply a sense of space. Uh, for me, being a West Texas boy, it reminds me of driving from Fort Worth to Midland, where I grew up. And in Midland, you'd look at the, the sign on the interstate and it would say El Paso. 324 miles, and you thought, good God, how could people live that far west, and how big is this state? Uh, Herzog selected Centaur because he felt like it evoked the early Spanish language books printed in what they would have called the New World. The full title spread here. Um, Herzog's original intention was to set the book entirely by monotype machine. That would allow him to adjust characters of type page by page, which was super important to Herzog. Uh, in this project. Um, the problem was that Herzog and Lee had decided to use a custom all cotton rag paper for this edition with a custom watermark, which I can show you after the presentation. It says King Ranch with a running W in the middle. Um, the paper is incredibly tough and incredibly resistant to ink. So when Herzog went to print the the type that he'd set by monotype machine, he found that it wore out much too quickly. Uh, much, so quick, as a matter of fact, that it would, even at a scale of $600,000, be not economical to print the book. And so he ordered to, uh, he put an order into McKinsey and Harris, the type foundry in San Francisco, and said, give me foundry type. Foundry type is typically uh, much stronger, much more resistant to um, deformation than uh, typeset by monotype. So he sent off McKenzie and Harris, sends him the type, uh, and it is also too soft. And so Herzog says, fine, I'll set the type myself, and then we'll create electroplated facsimiles. So it wouldn't be individual characters of type, but instead a single piece of uh, zinc this time, and he said, that'll resist it. And sure enough, uh, it didn't wear out but it left an uneven impression of ink on the printed page. In order to get the ink to transfer to the page well and evenly, uh, they actually ended up breaking their printing presses. Um, so it's kind of a comedy of errors, setting and printing this book. So Herzog gives up and he says, fine, I'll set it by hand and we'll print it offset, which is um, not a directly hands-on way of printing, uh, but it was the best that they could do under the circumstances. But only uh, Tom Lee's text, so the bulk of the, the narrative of the book uh, was printed offset. The end matter, so the bibliography was printed, believe it or not, in uh, Carl's shop at uh, the Texas Western Press. You can tell that it's printed offset thanks to the very tiny dots that you can see, especially in the gray, they may not be uh, legible uh, on the screen. I can show them to you in the book. Um, I love the story behind these running, this is the running W, the brand for the King Ranch, um, that Lee, Lee said, I could probably do that illustration. And he started looking at brands and he said, you know what, Carl, I can't do these. He said, these are in metal and I can't hand draw something like this. What we ought to do is get a pressman in your shop to bend brass rule in the shape of running W. And so you'll notice as you go through the book that the W's change shape over the course of the book in order to reflect kind of the organic nature of, uh, of uh, hand-bent brands. It's in this first image here that you can really see the texture of the paper, which is laid, by the way, um, Tom Lee's joke was that uh, the paper was so strong that he should have had shirts made out of it because he'd never have to buy shirts again. This is an advertising card uh, which we recently acquired in special collections. We try to co collect material around the publication of important books like this. This card is about three feet wide and actually was displayed in J. Frank Doby's cousin's shop, Dudley Doby 
who was a bookseller in San Marcos and later in Alpine, as a promotional for the King Ranch. Um, when the book was uh, finally released, it was heralded as one of the greatest achievements to that point in Texas bookmaking, printing, and uh, book design. Lee's narrative was generally well received. Uh, surprisingly, not really, J. Frank Doby wrote a scathing review uh, against uh, Tom Lee's narrative. Uh, the New Yorker gave it a really crummy review, too, no great surprise. Um, but other than that, people generally received the book fairly well. Uh, Lee did exhaustive research and had support, research support from Holland McCombs, and also to that point was the only person to have access to the King family and Kleberg family's personal papers, so he had access to archival sources that no one else had access to. Um, as a matter of fact, it was so successful that the first trade run published by under the imprint of Little, uh, Little Brown and Company, uh, and was a, an edition of 10,000 copies sold out prior to the release date. And the trade edition of the book was in print for 35 years following its initial publication. The Saddle Blanket edition, as I mentioned, was published in an edition of 3,000 that uh, for much of its life, for much of the time between the publication and uh, the present day was not for sale. It was only given as gifts to people that had worked at the King Ranch, uh, for libraries and museums and notable Texans. Ours is a result of that. Ours has an inscription, uh, a presentation note to uh, Ambassador Edward A. Clark, who gave us our copy. Um, until the mid-1980s, when they discovered that uh, Bob Kleberg had held back uh, 1,500 copies from the Saddle Blanket edition, and suddenly you could buy one again. But they are uh, creeping up in price. Um, if you wanted to get one, I will say uh, the one that I saw on the market was about $1,700, so they're not inexpensive books. Um, as a marker of the success of the book, uh, the American Institute of Graphic Arts selected it as one of its 50 best American books of the year for 1958. It was also selected as one of the best Western books of 1958 by the then super prestigious but now defunct bibliophilic club, the Rounds and Coffin Club out of California. And I think, uh, to conclude, the, the King Ranch is perhaps the best exemplar of the three themes that I hope I illuminated some for you this evening, um, that Herzog chose uh, to work with specific authors that would further his purposes in kind of a setting design for Texas books and furthering his own career as a printer, Tom Lee, chief among them. Um, I do think that the King Ranch is probably the best exemplar of the extremely excruciating close attention to detail that Herzog had for all of his projects. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, that um, Herzog happened to be in the right time at the right place. The Klebergs were willing to spend $600,000 on a book and wait six years for its production, and people were willing to read it because they were curious about Texas. Um, thank you, and I hope you've got some questions. <laughs>